Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I'm honored to be speaking to a really underrated film composer in my opinion. He's done so many pieces over the years. A lot I can learn from him. Uh, I'd like to welcome Kenneth Lample. How are you doing? Uh, th thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, 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 really, I, I really, really appreciate the fact that that I'm underrated. I really appreciate that someone recognizes that fact. Because <laughs> sometimes like in the professional world, you're like, wow, man, I've done like 90, over 90 movies. Has anyone noticed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's a lot. I mean, hey, I'll yeah. be honest, I haven't seen all of them, right? And I was looking yeah. through your resume and I was thinking, oh my gosh, holy crap, this guy's done so much stuff, <laughs> so much stuff. Yeah, so, so many, so, so many, uh, honestly, so many of them you wouldn't want to see. Maybe about a quarter, <laughs> maybe about a quarter of them you'd actually want to see. So many are just beyond terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, hey, you watch them to hear your score? That's what you do. Exactly. But but on it. But 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 that being said, one of the things I think is interesting about doing not great movies is that you really you have to do a good job. Like I feel like a lot of my training as a film composer has been through uh, scoring a lot of mediocre movies. Super, super important because right. the, because on those movies, the score carries the day because when, when you write movie, when you write music for a, for a, a movie that not that great and, you know, there's no chemistry between the characters, the drama kind of falls flat, your solely falls on the, the shoulders of the composer to carry the emotion and carry the day on those films. It's much, in some ways, it's much much easier to do scores for good movies because the because the 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 the, the, the acting, the performances, the cinematography is already setting the drama into motion. So you, it's like it's sort of like a a a, a car that's already in motion. You're, it's already moving forward in the right way dramatically. You just need to jump on board. Whether as opposed to when you're working on movies that are not good, the car is stopped, but you as the music actually have to push and get the car moving. So it's a lot more responsibility. And I think it, I think you learn a lot more from that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So are you aware that it's already a bad movie before while you're scoring it? Because you must get some sort of video feed or or something of that nature <laughs> to to get an idea of what you're scoring to. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. first, I mean, what what I do when I get contacted for a film and they say, oh, we're going to we're going to send it, send you uh, some video of, you know, either the dailies, you know, which is shots or we've got an edited or a rough edited copy. So I, I'll get the video file and then I will put my hands together and pray to God that it's it. I pray to God that it's that that the best I can hope for is that the film is mediocre and not just horrible beyond any possible imagination and so that's my prayer i, I pray before I, I open up the video and i watch the movie yeah you're well aware the first time and I, and there's so many times like you know it'd be in relationships and i'll be like watching the first cut and you know a girlfriend or wife comes in and she's like for real because <laughs> everybody thinks movies are really good because the bad the, the bad movies never get out do you know what i mean so you're used to because you don't realize the quality control of what you see like netflix they're all going to be pretty darn good to awesome mm. because it's a it's it's quality control sbs so all, all your streaming services your it's all all the good stuff makes it there so people get so used to watching that they think all movies are good you know what i mean they think most movies are pretty good you know but there's a whole sort of 90 percent of ones that made that don't even get it that far that are just so terrible right but you've managed to go beyond that despite some of these moving movies being terrible <laughs> Your score stands yeah. out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've won Absolutely. So many awards. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be a hater on the films either. You know, what I mean? and because also, on on a lot of them, I'm really good friends with the filmmakers, and we just had a great, you know, I mean, it, it, it was some terrible horror film, maybe, you know, and we just had such a great time. It was just we had super fun, you know, it was just super fun. Mm. So a lot of it is just fun and and things like that. Yeah, and then like another. You sort of quarter quarter of the movies you get are really really good, and that's also really really nice, really really nice. Yeah. So you must be aware that Marvel Disney have relocated their productions to Sydney for the next foreseeable future. I mean, next five years or ten years. Yeah, yeah, I read about are, that. Are you able to capitalize on that in any way, and maybe do a blockbuster? I mean, Canberra <laughs> is like a, sto a, a stone's throw away from Sydney, so. 
what 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 they do is it's it's a they use Australia for the workforce, not for any of the sort of higher level creative things. So you're 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 not going to get a composer. You're not going to get a generally like a cinematographer. All the key positions will be U.S. positions, and then they'll come here and use uh, all Australian crews, maybe VFX teams. But the teams will all be headed up by Hollywood studio people. And now there, there there's that. Let but but. I'm not saying that in a disparaging way. I mean, getting so so number one, so it'll be hard to get just because they're shooting here. It's difficult to get that land that job as a composer because those decisions are already have been made in L.A. Now, but what's happened? But what this does bring to to Australia that is not seen or looked upon, but is very good is so you know, to to my knowledge, most of the main members. So so even if if in Australia they're coming for crew. And they're coming, say, for special effects. A lot of them come for special effects teams. Now, generally, a lot of times the teams will be headed by, you know, someone very, very well known in Hollywood will come over and sort of train the team, work with the team. Now, what's happened is we, we're getting generations of Australians filmmakers who have been on that on those sets and VFX teams who have been trained by those people now making their own movies in Australia. And so that's that's exactly why, you know, for example, the 2067 score is a complete outgrowth of that. So the director, Seth Lardy, who's brilliant, 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 brilliant beyond imagination, he worked on Star Wars. He worked on The Matrix in the special effects departments. So he's learned, and he's not the only one. There's, there's other ones, uh, other directors too, who have learned from these experience by being on these Hollywood productions. And now we're bringing that to Australian filmmaking. And I think that's a really, really, really important part of what's happening in the film industry in Australia. And, and one of the reasons that, for example, with 2067, which is, a, I think, a really important movie in terms of Australian film in general, because it's the first, it's the first Australian action sci-fi blockbuster film that's directly competing with everything that's, that's being produced in Hollywood, all the Marvel and DC and things like that. And that's really important because Pretty much before that, Australia and also Australia also has a, a great and New Zealand. I'm not leaving New Zealand out. <laughs> okay. has, has 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 had a tradition of really great films. Do you know what I mean? They're and and great filmmakers. They they to my mind they tended to be really 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 great independent films. You know, like small budget. I'm talking like sort of less than ten million dollars. You know, really, but but really good dramas on a small scale. You know, and, and then they've gone to festivals like Sundance and Venice and Toronto, won awards, and then the film gets a lot of, you know, sort of traction back in Australia. Th that's what I see is that's generally what's happened. Now, what the, the 2067 is different because it's actually competing. It, it's still in that price range, but it's competing with hundreds of million dollar films, the, all, you know, all the big action films of Hollywood. And I think it, and I think it does that pretty well for a fraction of the budget. Now, because these guys have been trained by the Hollywood special effects teams and they know how to do these things now on a lower scale. So I think that's, I think that's actually quite important. Hmm. So how did you end up on that project? How did that all come about? Uh, that, uh, Cause I came to Australia four years ago to be the head of the school of music at Australian national university in Canberra. That's what I came for. And during that time, um, ca uh, actually Canberra, started uh, the film industry started in Cambridge around the same time oh, and, wow. and funding. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They have a film ACT. And so that there was money from the government coming into coming into the ACT for film. So all this happened at the same time. And when I came, I, uh, I was introduced to a you know, production company called uh, Silver Sun. And through them, they they were making they had a uh, a program where they were taking sort of emerging directors. They they would take sort of ten screenplay writers, and they would develop the scripts. They'd work with industry professionals, and then from there, they would select one of the ten scripts to actually finance and shoot the film, low budget. And so, uh, the first film that they did in this sort of journey was one called The Furies, this horror film. And so, being that they wanted to keep everything in Canberra, there are not a lot of film composers in Canberra. So, and I knew those guys. So I, I got brought on to do the score to the Furies first. And one of the producers on the Furies was a woman named Lisa Shaughnessy, who has a film company in, in Sydney called uh, Arcadia. And so, uh, so we worked together, you know, of course, I, you know, I did the best job that I could. They, everybody was happy with the results of the music. And then she was telling me that her husband, Seth, 
was making a science fiction film and that, you know, he was looking around for composers that she thinks that, you know, we should all get together and meet and sort of chat and see what kind of chemistry we had. So then Lisa, her husband, Seth, and I, and also uh, at the time I did the score with uh, another composer, Kirsten Axelholm. So the four of us got together and we met and we all just kind of hit it off. And so just from that, you know, this is probably about a year out before the film started shooting, then started, you know, doing demos for Seth and he liked, you know, the sort of stuff we were doing and then the film was shot and then there we are. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. There we are. So um, you mentioned that you came over from America to Australia. So mm -hmm. was that always the plan? You wanted to be a lecturer at a university? I had, I, I've always been. I've oh, you always, always been. Happy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, for a long time. So I've always sort of balanced the academic world and the professional world, and that's that's of great interest. As soon as as soon as I finished at the finished my doctoral degree at the Juilliard School, I was hired to teach there. So I was doing film scores oh, wow. back in those days, film scores and commercials. I was teaching there, and then from there, I'd taken a couple of years off where I was just working as a composer, and then I went back and I taught at a small private college called Hofstra University in Long Island, where I ran their uh, music business and technology program all along, you know, doing, you know, film, mainly, mainly film and television work. I had sort of left the advertising stuff behind. So that's something, you know, I, I had a university job before I came to Australia. And that's one of the things that why Australia National University was interested in, in me because I, I was I was coming to the table with a very, very broad background, not just in the academic world, but a high profile uh, commercial career at the same time. So those things are very important. And they were, you know, in, in, in Canberra, they were looking to sort of redesign the School of Music and have it be something that was just different than what they had had. And so I sort of came and I headed it redesigned it to wait to be what I would call a 21st century school of music, you know, one that that it wasn't sort of so much about genres because most schools of music are on the European conservatory model, whereas, you know, you're either a, you know, classical violin player and there's a track for that. You're a jazz saxophonist, there's a track for that. You're an uh, audio engineer, there's a track for that. That those sort of um, compart that kind of compartmentalization didn't make sense anymore. It made sense in 1950 or even 1980, yeah. but it did, but from the eight, from the nineties on, that doesn't make sense anymore to have those kind of compartments, like being a performer or a composer, you know, being a, a performer or being someone who's technically uh, savvy in the recording studio that nowadays you need a skill set that goes across all of those things. And so how I designed this, the school of music at ANU was to be one where you, you, you could have that sort of vertical, you know, if you want to be an opera singer, you can do that. But there's a lot of lot of flexibility horizontally. So you could be a viola player and take audio engineering and film scoring at the same time. Because oh, what I see. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting. So that's what I would call the 21st century musician is all, all my friends who are doing well. Um, one of my one of my closest friends is a cellist named Dave Vagar and Dave Dave is famous for the the Coldplay song Viva La Vida, the cello line. Dun 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 dun. Oh yep. Yeah. yeah. So Dave and I went to Juilliard together. He's probably probably the the best known studio cellist in, in the U.S. Certainly probably in the world. He's worked with everybody. You know, one week he's you know recording with Coldplay, then he's doing the Elgar Cello Concerto, and then he's you know on tour with Evanescence, and then he's writing arrangements, doing film scores. So I started modeling our program and what I saw my my friends do. Another good friend of mine, John Dinklage, concert master on Hamilton, plays on film scores, violinist with the uh, rock band Rush. You know, so oh. yeah, so so all the people that are doing really well and we're, and we're doing really interesting kind of things. We're all performers, composers, improvisers. Uh, we're savvy with music tech, could mix, could, you know, do a lot, had broad range of skills. So I was more interested in, in, in having that kind of music program than a, than a traditional sort of conservatory program. So that's what, that's sort of what brought me to ANU. Yeah. So how do you balance all of that out, right? Because if you're doing all the academic stuff and then you're on a project, because usually with say film, right, you've got, I don't know, a month or two months to kind of cram in all this music. You're usually under a tight deadline. Yeah. Um, just after that, you, you know how to do it fast. I, I think, I think it depends on what kind of stuff you're doing too. Um, there's less of that here in Australia than there was in the, in the U S I did a lot of television and stuff like that. And that was 
absolutely insane. I mean, there were times I did this, I did this, this television series on a cable called Born Again Virgin. Um, and so they were doing two episodes a week. And so for that, it was me and, a, and another composer. And there were, there were times that I got a call. So you'd have a week to do an episode, which was, you know, 22 minutes. And so there were times that I got a call from the producers like, hey, do you think you could do the score um, now? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> and I've said like, you mean in a couple of days? No, do you think you could do it at this very moment? And so I was like, okay, give me like five hours. And like, so five hours, I would turn around 22 music, 22 minutes of music. So I got used to... I got used to those those course of things, and 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 one of the nice things about Australia, the because I've done I'm on my third film here in Australia, so generally I've been brought in early, so I've got a lot of time. Even even because this is what happens, I can I can write fast, you know. Certainly, I, I you know in a day I could get for for the television stuff. Oftentimes I was doing ten minutes of mixed, finished, completed music a day. You know, so I'd have a week to do a television movie that might be 60 to 90 minutes of music. So I just, I've done so many of those. Now, you're not going to do the most innovative score doing that, but you can certainly do function, which for television, they just need functional. You know, we, it's a heartwarming Christmas story. Okay, great. That's, we know how to do that. You know what I mean? But still doing, you know, 10 minutes of music a day is a lot. 10 minutes of finished mixed music a day is a lot. You know, so I'd have about a week to do the, te the television movies I had a week to do which I did. Um, and you just get, you just get good at that sort of fast thing. No, they're not, I wouldn't say that they're my, their scores that hold up as sort of my most interesting kind of scores, but it's certainly functional worked in the movie, you know, that sort of thing. So, I, so from, from doing it a lot, you get those, those sort of skill sets and, and being able to do it fast then balances with sort of the academic life, you know, with your teaching and things like that, you know, because there's also breaks and, you know, how to sort of arrange your schedule if you need to take a day off. It, it all, I've been amazed because it's, it's funny that you say that because most directors, when I tell them that I'm, you know, certainly full-time professor, they get really nervous about their deadlines. But every, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years and it always just, you know, always kind of works out in a nice way. And again, in Australia, the films I've had, you know, like the 2067, I worked on a year before it shot. You know what I mean? Oh, right. Yeah. Pretty ahead of time, even with uh, the Furies. I mean, that was a good three months, you know, so I had plenty of time. There was no rush. There's no, because generally the, the films here, there's not as much rush on as there is in the U.S. in terms of production schedules, because they're more, because the independent there's not a big studio that's churning out, you know, you know, X 10 films, you know, X amount of films a year that we got to get this wrapped up because then the studio goes into production on the next sort of thing that they're also sort of being in the independent space that you generally have time. And, and a film that I'm, that I'm currently working on is, is one called the host. And we're not even, we, I've been working on the music for about two months. We're not even going to shoot till July. So already there's going to be sort of four months ahead and we're solidifying a lot of things. And then there's going to be while production is going on. The film's not going to wrap up till the end of December. So I've already started two months ago until December. So there's going to be plenty, plenty of time to, to do a really good and really interesting because that's that's the thing is when you have time you can do really really cool stuff like you know for example like on 2067 I think is an example in my own sort of output of like really really cool synthesizing of of uh, you know the giant epic orchestral score with a lot of really interesting sound design elements so you're sort of not sure what the orchestra what's a real instrument and you know what's sort of a soundscape. So mm -hmm. I think that that you know that makes for a really sort of interesting creative opportunity. I watched Twenty Sixty Seven again last night, uh, just before this actually, and yeah, the, your your soundtrack for that is amazing. A lot of the choral stuff that you do, because that's kind of your signature sound. I find those the the kind of choral epic music that you have is that always recorded with an actual uh, choir, or do you? implement a little bit of synthesized choir with it? Is it a combination of both? Like, how was your process that's a, with that? <laughs> that's a very interesting question because as someone, you know, so you, you probably know that I've done a lot of concert choral music. Yeah. Outside, outside, outside of film, one of the things I did quite a bit in the U.S. was, I, I do less here because um, there's just not as many choirs here in the U.S. There's just you can't every every school, every high school, every university's got a choir, and so they've got choral association. Like when you go to the choral association, there's thousands and thousands of choral directors that you meet. I mean, there's just 
tens of thousands of choirs across the U.S. So I did a lot of choral music, mostly uh, mostly in Hebrew. So I did a lot of oh. he- yeah, all, all my pretty much all my choral my published choral music is in Hebrew. Um, so that that was something that I really really enjoyed. Um, so I did a lot of that there, and then because that all came from using choir on film scores. It, 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 but but again, going back to the 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 tie in with the university, that's very very nice. Is I used at the my university Hofstra University. We had a very very good choir there and a very good choral director that I'd used the student choir on one of my scores, and then the choir director said, "Oh, this is really nice. You should actually write a piece for us for the, one of the concerts." And so I did and really enjoyed that. And it's really from film music, I got involved with, with choral music that way. Now for the, for the score, so I've used a lot of live choir. For the score of 2067, there's, there's, there's no live choir at all. It's only orchestra. Really? Well, that's a testament <laughs> to how good you are then because it <laughs> sounds like it's a legit choir. Yeah, yeah. But, but a, a lot of it nowadays too is... Most of the orchestra, most of the orchestra in the soundtrack is sample libraries. I mean, we there's probably the sound that sound the score is is just under two hours of score. We only recorded maybe twenty or thirty minutes of live orchestra in the entire mm. the entire thing. So a lot of a, a lot a lot of it is like I've been brought up. You know, I, I, all the films that I've done have been except for a couple, like the Pokemon movies were studio films. Most of it has been independent film. So I, especially in, in, in New York, which was the area that I live. So New York, we were like, this is a, a gorilla making sort of film training, which is, I mean, those guys and half the films didn't even have permits. They would just run around New York City without permits <laughs> shooting. And do you know what I mean? I'm talking about like, you know, I've done so many films where like, it's just financed by the, you know, the director. Do you know what I mean? It's not, you know, I mean, like some, some of the budgets were like less than $10,000. I mean, crazy. And so just from doing like 40, 50 films like that, you start to learn about how to get the best out of what you got at home. Because mm. for most of the stuff, there was not time to, for most of the stuff, you know, that I've done in my life, there has, there's, there's no time to record an orchestra. You know what I mean? It's, there's no budget for that sort of thing, but you had to learn how to get good at mixing. You had to get good at, at about how to use your sound library as well. Yeah. And- yeah. Yeah. Cause a lot of, uh, with technology these days, a lot of the sound libraries are actually pretty realistic, right? Like if you're playing a note on a keyboard at a different velocity, it changes the sound. Even if you're playing something like a trumpet or. At, some- yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it actually works for the most part if you know how to master it. I'd imagine stuff like guitars, though, they're pretty hard to implement through MIDI. You'd have to play them live usually, right? Well, some of the actually some of the guitars, I mean, the, one of the things you have to recognize is the software nowadays is so incredibly advanced. Mm. The, I mean, the guitar software that I use, it, you can just pick strumming patterns. I mean, it's the most incredible thing. You just play the chords in any different kind of reversions, it automatically the algorithm of the this, this is this is a, this is a Native Instruments program called Strummed Acoustic Guitar. It will just based on your chords give you the proper chord voicings on the guitar. It won't take your piano voicings. It'll incorporate them into guitar voicings, and when you change chords on the piano, it will go to the next voicing a guitar player would play and you've got tons of rhythmic patterns to choose from it's indistinguishable from the re- it's indistinguishable oh, wow. from the real thing yeah it's it's it the sample libraries are just so incredibly advanced you just i mean the orchestra libraries too it's it's nearly indistinguishable from the real you know from from the real thing mm. and 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 also that being said is there's very, very few scores nowadays that don't combine both live orchestra and sample libraries. This is also really important. It's not an era of sample libraries until you've got the live orchestra, then you toss the sample libraries away. Because one of the great, great, I've had a a few people that have really profoundly changed my life just in terms of of musicianship. The first one was, was studying with John Williams. And the second one was studying with a gentleman named Alan Meyerson. Now, Alan is Hans Zimmer's score mixer. Oh, wow. Everything that I know. Yeah, yeah. Everything I know about, I learned about score mixing, I learned from Alan. And I mean, he's done not just Hans' stuff, but he's the uh, go-to film score mixer. And one of the most important things I learned from him 
was uh, he told this anecdote about, so on all those Hollywood scores, there's always sample libraries, sample orchestra with live orchestra is the way that all those Han scores. I mean, if you listen to stuff like Pirates of the Caribbean and Inception, that's not what a real orchestra sounds like. In, it's enhanced orchestra. It's or, you know, it's uh, uh, Alan calls it rock. He calls it rock and roll orchestra. You know, <laughs> yeah, which is a combination of sample libraries and and live playing. Mm -hmm. And he, he and Alan used to say that you know he would go into the they go into the mixing room and he'd have you know Alan would have a couple of faders on the mixing console. One was the live orchestra and one was the was the sample orchestra and he would play his balance and Hans would always come up and slide up the sampled orchestra and bring down the, the live orchestra. Alan would bring up live orchestra, slide down the, the sampled orchestra. Hans would bring up the sample orchestra, yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. So given like yeah. the plethora of people that you know, because Hollywood and that industry or the any type of media industry, whether it's music or film, it's more who you know than what you know, right? Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't any of these people That's put in a good word for you to give you a Marvel <laughs> movie or a Star Wars movie or something? <laughs> I wish. I, I I guess up to up to this point, I guess not. <laughs> but I yeah, look, I certainly, I certainly have a, have the skill set to do those kinds of things. Oh, you definitely and I, do. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that was also the nice thing, and, and the thing that I appreciate so much about the opportunity to work with Seth on Twenty Sixty Seven is is I had not had the opportunity to just do a balls to the wall, big over the top action science fiction score ever, you know? So that was such a, just such a, such a, you know, great opportunity to be able to do something like that. And look, I think, you know, everyone's got to make use of the opportunities in front of them. That was just never, you know, the going, you know, and going to Hollywood and, and doing those sort of things just was never, you know what I mean? It's like, I think, cause I, I, you know, I'm a big believer at, you know, that there's, there's the divine is watching over all of us, you know, and has specific plans for all the things that we do. And if you think that I, that, that I don't go to go to those movies and hear those scores and wish that was me, absolutely. I certainly do. But it just up to this point, it quite, it quite hasn't been in the cards that I feel like, you know, the, the divine of the universe has, has other plans, you know, which is also, it's also totally cool. And I think, but I think that's, those are also things that one comes to terms with a certain age of life too, you know? Oh, well, hey, it could still happen for you. Yeah, I think, but, but I have to, but I, I got to tell you, it's, it's funny because I feel like things are real in that, in that, in that, you know, you know, I was to look at my, you know, career that way and think about, you know, the things that goes on Hollywood. I think that there's, I, I feel like I'm at a point of time now where, where now, now I'm coming, now I'm coming into my own in a big way. Right. You know, the 20, 2067 was really, really important for me artistically, you know, cause that's, that's showing that that can be done here. And number one, it's showing that that kind of big epic thing can be done on a, on an indie film budget in Australia. I think number one, that's important. And then for me particularly as an artist, it's important to say that, look, this kind of score can be delivered right here on a small budget right in Australia. Mm. Because most of, for, for what we made, you know, for, for what, you know, the Avengers music budget was, was the probably the entire budget of 2067, yeah, you know, of the probably. entire movie. You, you know what I mean? That, that, yeah. But that's, you know, so it's, so, so that being said, I, I'm thinking that I'm going to get a lot, just professionally, I'm thinking that I'll get traction because there are, like, for example, this next movie that I'm working on, The Host, the director contacted Seth because he liked the score and said, oh, who was your, who was your composer on that? I really, really like that score. You know, so I got in touch with him that way. And there'll be other, there, there are other directors who, who I sort of knew who, who heard the score and said, wow. I really, oh. like, we should, we should definitely do something. So I think, I think in terms of, because I, I think for, for everybody in their career, they have their breakout project, you know, mm. that really, like, like, for example, like a, a great example is John, so, some, some composers come to the table and they get their recognition early on Hans, Hans, for example. Yeah. You know, the, those first scores, uh, Rain Man, his first, his, one of his very first film scores, Academy Award nominated, you know, Academy, he won the Academy Award for Rain Man, Thelma and Louise, you know what I mean? All just back to back Academy nominated, you know, either winning or, so he just came right out of the gate, you know, and that was also a totally, him getting the Rain Man score was totally random. 
it happened that um, who was the, I can't remember the director of of Rain Man. Um, anyway, so it's the director's wife heard some little obscure independent film that Hans had done, one of Hans's first films, liked it, played the soundtrack for her husband who was making Rain Man. He liked it. No one knew who Hans Zimmer was or how to even get in contact with him. So suddenly the, the director somehow tracks him down and, it, and Hans tells the story. It's like one night at like 11, 10 or 11 p.m., he gets a knock on the studio door. Hans is an assistant to this other film composer named Stanley Myers who did Deer Hunter and just gets a knock on the door. Are you Hans Zimmer? Yeah, yeah. My name's Barry Levinson. I'm doing a movie called Rain Man. Would you, I'd like to talk to you about doing the music. I mean, completely out of randomness. And then Hans goes over, you know, spends a few months with, with Barry, produces his first big score, Academy, wins the Academy Award. His, you know what I mean? Which, which sets a trajectory for his career. Now, that was very different for someone like John Williams. I'll never forget when I was sitting with, with John and talking about, because John Williams' big breakout score was Jaws. Mm. Right before, so was Jaws was his first big breakout score. And he said to me, he said, Ken, he said, do you know that Jaws was my 40th film score? Whoa, okay. There is, and if you look back, and as I started to really get into John's, like the Poseidon Adventure, Towering Inferno, uh, Jane, All Jane Eyre, I mean, all these films that Earthquake, that you're like, oh uh, yeah, I remember Towering Inferno a little bit. Was that him? You know, but just 40 films until that. And then it was that Spielberg collaboration with Jaws that led uh, Spielberg to recommend John Williams to George Lucas. Mm. So that's where that's 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 where it all starts. And and in fact, a lot of people don't know this, but originally George Lucas was not going to have an original score for Star Wars, but with the score was going to be pre-existing pieces of classical music. That the idea of having original music was was sort of later on in the process idea. That's amazing. So like when you studied under John Williams, was there any specific advice that he gave you that uh, you hope? So I mean, I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, there's probably heaps, right? But what's some of the stuff that you remember that he told you early on? Some, some really important, th I'll, I'll tell you the first, uh, I'll, I'll give, I love, I love, I love talking about John Williams because he's just, the, the idea of studying with him. Now, see, I'm of the generation, I saw the original Star Wars in the movie theaters, kid. So that made a huge impact. I mean, you can't understand. I mean, this is, you can't understand what a big deal the first Star Wars was because you had never seen anything like that before. Like those, kind, even though we look back on the movies and the special effects are like super cheesy and they look like models. At the time, you had never seen anything like that. And so when, when it opens and the ship comes flying overhead, like as kids, you're like ducking. You're like, oh my God, you're like keeping your head down, you know? It was just unlike anything we had ever seen because before that it was like, you know, Buck Rogers and all this really, really cheesy, you know, the day the earth stood still with the Whoa! theremin kind of score. That's what, you know, that's what space movies were, you know, other than of course, 2001, which was a holy, which was not Star Wars kind of thing. That's an art, completely different art film. Yeah. But Star Wars really, there was no, it really set, the tone for what kind of what what that genre the action what the action movie and the science fiction action movie would be, and um, and the idea in even as a kid when I saw it I mean I own Star Wars on vinyl in fact I own many people don't know this but there was actually a disco Star Wars as well so I own disco there's disco versions of all the Star Wars pieces yeah you can find it on YouTube it's by a, a group called Miko M E C C O so there's disco okay. Star Wars yeah and there's also down. Yeah, there's also disco close encounters too. So anyway, so the idea of studying with him, because I, I the studying with him came from there's a, a well-known music festival in, in the US called Tanglewood, which is the summer home of the Boston Symphony. So what Tanglewood is is they they it's a it's a fellowship program where they allow one orchestra's worth of students to study with the Boston Symphony and five composers to study with whoever the composer in residence with the Boston Symphony was. And so, um, so I was, when I finished Juilliard, I was accepted as one of the composer fellows. And it's amazing because it's, 
at, at Tanglewood, like it's concerts every night, the Boston Symphony, all the who's who of classical music is there performing, but there's concerts every night. So it's, it's really, it's popular because people go up there for a week and go to, people, the lovers of classical music will go to Tanglewood, spend a week or two weeks, go to concerts every night, you know, go to lectures. It's really a wonderful place. And so then we got to, as fellows, we got to go to all the concerts for free, the rehearsals for free. And at the time, John was the conductor of the Boston Pops and he just finished Schindler's List. And so he was one of the, we had a few composers that we studied with and he was one of the composers that we could study with. And that was why, you know, I, uh, I applied to the program. So the idea of, and he was always my sort of musical hero, the idea of studying with the guy who was your, my childhood, you know, eats, uh, these, this is, was the foundation of all my most uh, seminal musical experiences, the Star Wars score, Close Encounters score, Indiana Jones score, E.T., E.T., which is my favorite film score of all time. But I, these, these are things as a kid that became sort of the, the fabric and foundation of my love of all music. Um, so when, when, when we studied with him, the very first meeting, you know, was just him and like five of us, you know, that even if he, I, I was just happy that John Williams was acknowledging my existence for an hour. Do you know what I mean? Just like <laughs> I, before he even said anything, I'm like, I'm in a room with John Williams and we're breathing the same air. That's good enough for me. I could die and be very satisfied at this very, very moment. Fair enough. I think I'd be <laughs> the same. Yeah. <laughs> and so he said, look, he said, I'm not, he's a, cause he's a, actually a very, very quiet person. Very, very quiet person. And he said, look, he said, I'm not a teacher, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on some some cues from movies that I've scored and I'm just going to talk about what I see in the movie. I said, oh, that, that sounds cool. And so the first thing he put on, he put on a scene from Jaws. Now he puts on this scene where uh, where, where they're, they, they've got this harpoon and they're scrambling to hook up the barrels to the harpoon because they're going to harpoon, they're going to shoot the shark in the barrels. The idea is the barrels keep the shark above water so they can keep shooting it. But as they're, they're scrambling to put the barrels on and the, and the shark, they shoot the shark, the shark is so strong, keeps pulling the barrels under the water. And so he just, he probably played about three, you know, two or three minutes of that. And then he stopped and what came out of his mouth at that point just changed my life. What came out of his mouth is Jung, archetypes of the collective unconscious, the narrative development of the film, the journey of the hero, the symbolism of the shark and the transformation of the hero figure of time. It was like, it was a Jungian psychology. It was archetypes. It was mythology. It was literary criticism because my great, my other great love other than, than music is philosophy and psychology. I actually studied psychology. So he was speaking oh. all the things. Yeah. Just, so it was for me, the, it was like the sort of the rays of heaven and the, the, the pearly, you know, gates opened and then the celestial choirs began to sing because it was the first time it was the unification of my big loves of music and philosophy slash psychology, especially of, of Jung, who I was a big, big fan of. And I saw that this was the place where those two things could come together. I mean, it's just how he taught, what he could see in the movies was just mind boggling, mind boggling. And so some of the things that he talked about, which were quite interesting, that, that was just interesting enough because you think, you think he's a great composer is why he's a great film composer. No, it's what he sees in the movies is just, you can't imagine his, his, yeah. What he sees in the movies is brilliant. And he also brings to the table probably the greatest musical skill set I've ever seen among anybody. Because, you know, like at the time that I went to study with him, I was very skeptical about film music because this was the days where, you know, the Hollywood film composers, a lot of them didn't read music. They would just sort of improvise in MIDI and then get a team of highly trained conservatory musicians like myself to transcribe it, to orchestrate it and then not to get any credit for it. Mm. So this is what, and so I was very skeptical of what, of, of this whole thing about film music. And so John completely alleviated me of any of those. Like, so at the time, you know, I was also teaching at the Juilliard school. So I'm thinking like, all right, pal, I said, I, I'm, I'm with the best of the best. And you, if you, if you want to impress me, you really got to show some game here because I'm, I know what good big game looks like. And so one day I come into one of my composition lessons and it was so amazing. We had less one-on-one -on -one lessons with him. So I came into lessons and he, he brought some film clips for us to score. And so I was scoring a scene from Empire of the Sun. And so I come into my lesson and there's no piano because I'm, I'm a saxophonist and a pianist. And, and I had my, or my big orchestra score and 25 staves deep. And I said, John, I said, I'm really bummed out. I said, I don't have, we don't have a piano. I wanted to play you my score. And he said, oh, I don't need a piano. He grabs a score from me 
and 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 he puts the VHS tape because back in those days we scored to VHS tape. Tape. He pushes play. He looks at the times. He looks at the tempo. Not only does he have perfect pitch, he's got perfect tempo, and he just starts beating time and singing back the entire orchestra score in time to the movie. And they're like, oh, I love it. Uh, no, it's a beautiful viola line. Oops, should be F sharp in the second flute part. Oops, missing dynamic marking in the bass trombone. He sang through all the, he sang through the entire score, all the parts in, in sync to the movie, pointing out all the mistakes in the score the first time around. Oh it my was, gosh. It was the most impressive display of musicianship I had ever seen in my entire life. You, I, I'm telling you, all listeners, you cannot imagine how good he is. You can, however good you think he is, he is a thousand times better than that. Unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. He's very humble about it too, but he's also a very, very much a master of melody. You know, you listen to a yeah. lot of films these days and obviously the cinematic films, they, they can hit you emotionally, but they don't sometimes have a memorable melody. Whereas yeah. he was a master of that, right? From Jaws, yeah. to Star Wars, Indiana Jones. Absolutely. You know, just so good at it. And it's also interesting because he came to composition late too. He actually, many people don't know this, but he went, he has a master's degree in uh, classical piano from Juilliard. Oh. Yeah, yeah. He's, I don't think he's I a, no. Yeah, yeah. He came, he came to compose. It's interesting that he came to composing late in the game. Not like sort of he composed a bit, but it wasn't toward it wasn't until sort of later on in in life that mm. he started getting interested in in composing. And it was and it's ironic that suddenly he would become the the greatest, you know, the greatest the guy, probably, the goat. Yeah, yeah, really. yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I I would say easily. I mean, the most influential composer of the late twentieth century by far. Oh yeah, no, no I think I think that. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just yeah, his musical skills are just unbelievable. Mm. Yeah, it's a wow. So I want to ask you about uh, <laughs> yeah. Pokemon. How did you end up doing Pokemon? <laughs> that's that's like a very interesting I, run, right? Because that's what that is... the biggest media franchise in the world. I found that out recently. Actually, I thought it was Star Wars or Marvel, but it's actually Pokemon. This is it was the weirdest thing. So this is when I first started getting involved. After I studied with John, I was like, okay, I want to get involved in film scoring. I didn't know anybody. But I was teaching at Juilliard, and one of the staff members, this a woman, uh, she do, she'd done some film scoring. And I said to her, I said, "Look, I said I'd, I, I'm interested in film scoring. I'd love to be your assistant. You know, I could I could help out. I could do additional music, whatever you need. I'd like I, I'd like to be part. I, I just sit in the studio and just watch you work. You know, I said, what it, I'm just interested in it. And if you you know could use me in any way, I'd really, really appreciate it." And so, um, you know, she had done some well-known independent films. And so, you know, a few months later, we, we talked together. She said, oh, she said, I have something. She said, I, I was approached about doing some music to some kids show, Pokemon or something. I mean, now, this is early 90s. This is before it's big. Now, at the time, I'm dating a girl who's got... Uh, nieces and nephews, and they're all trading Pokemon cards. So I knew this is going to be, I was around little kids. I, and I also taught little kids piano. This is before it was in any kind of cultural awareness. I, all the kids were dealing Pokemon cards. I knew this was going to be big. I'm thinking, so she said, you know, there's some Pokemon thing. I don't know what this is. She said, I don't really want to do it. Would you do it for me? And I'm thinking like, she has, she didn't have kids. I was like, she has no idea she doesn't know. what this is. And I said, look, I said, as a favor to you, I'll do it. But I said, but you owe me one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what it was is there was a team of us. There's a team of us who did the, the two movies. And it was just, you know, being part of the, and this was, this was the gig. So we went and there were a, a, a cup, you know, I, mean, I don't know how many, five, six, 10, I don't know. A group of us met with the Pokemon people. And they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hand you each five, 10 minutes of the movie, and you're going to write music and bring it back tomorrow. And is that it? That's, 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 that it. Was you it. Don't have to try and sync it with other people. Other they're composers? like, yeah, they, no, they're like, okay. yeah, they're like, look, you know, here's some themes that we can, you can use or not use. We need it all done tomorrow. Just come back tomorrow with it done. It seems like an odd way of doing it. Cause yeah, cause usually what, what, what yeah, because usually when you have multiple composers, you've got to find some way of kind of segueing the music so it's all distributed evenly so it sounds like it's one composer. 
So what, what had happened originally, they did have a composer, one composer, but he dropped the ball. And so they oh. just, the, so they, they, he dropped the ball on it. Um, and so they just pulled a team together at, the, at sort of the 11th hour and said, we need all the music this week. He did, the original guy did some of it. What was ever left, they distributed out here. They said, here's some themes. If you want to use them, use them. If not, not. We just need the move. We just need music tomorrow. Right. Because at that stage, the, had the show been released? The no, animation? this is the no. very, no, no, no. This is the very first movie. This is but before had, anything. But had the games been, I can't remember. Was the game released at least? I don't think, I think the cards, I, th I think, don't get me wrong. I think it was the, this, the movie came right after the cards and then there was the animated series and the games and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. Because now the, the anime and the games have very iconic themes. So I was going to yeah, ask yeah. if you were able to incorporate them. But if you did it prior to that, then that's actually pro yeah. probably a good thing because then you might have been influenced if you had to take uh, yeah. from, from the show or from the games, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. Just, look, I'm sure that they've got their people that they use on it. You know what I mean? Oh, there, yeah, there's... Course. There's the, the, the Japanese guys who they used, you know, for the series and stuff like that. And now it's all, yeah, this is just sort of the first sort of at the gate. And that mm. was that. <laughs> crazy, crazy. <laughs> I watched your uh, your interview that you did with Mick Gordon after you told me that you were friends with him. Very good. Bible. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very good. I I found that um we actually asked some of the similar questions actually it was interesting. Oh, is that um, the one that the, the National Film and Sound Archive? Yeah, yeah. It, it, oh, was that, yeah. That, that was that that was done at the university, was it not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the National Film and Sound Archive is right on the campus of ANU. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not part of the university, but it's on the campus of the ANU. Have you have you talked with Mick about doing some possible collaboration with him? I I, I haven't. When did I, I talked to him probably a bunch of months ago. Like he, because in, in, in the program that I run at A and U, I have a, a a bunch of guys that come in and do sort of Skype Skype online lectures with the students. So right. they, you know, so Mick came in and talked about Doom and the things he does. I'd love actually what I'd really like to do, but COVID kind of put a damper on it. What I'm I'm really keen on doing is when you know as 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 we have time in the in travel restrictions ease, I'd really like to go up to uh go up to his studio in brisbane and actually learn some stuff from him he's amazing just unbelievable because he's also in a completely different kind of world than i'm in so that's why i'm very keen on yeah. you know very different kind of composer well that's why i think you guys would do a great collaboration because he's more gaming you're more film uh but there's elements i mean you're very good at melody he's very good at melody your mixing is very good his is very good as well so I'm wondering if there could be, a, uh, it might be, well, you never know with these things. But yeah. Usually I would think in this instance that a collaboration would be natural. You know, I you think would, it'd be, look, I, I think it'd be yeah. cool. I think it'd be like super cool. I, I think he's a fantastic, I think he's fantastic about And he just also has a completely different kind of skill set than I have, you know, because his background is as sort of as a rock guitar player, synthesizer program. And they get all those, because again, mixing is a very, Specific, mixing is is a broad term that's not very broad every you need to be good at mixing the kind of music that you do yeah do well, that's, like that's the thing right when you're mixing uh metal you mix it very different to how you would with hip-hop for example or even orchestra because it's yeah. it's a different feel so like say with hip-hop music the the vocals are very much front and center and mm -hmm. with metal it's more the guitars. So every genre, there's a different way to mix it. So, yeah. yeah. And I think you can look, I think, you know, certainly I've mixed, you know, hip hop and stuff like that. I, and I can do it well because I can hear things and like, oh, the vocal needs a de -esser or, you know, on, on, a, on a basic level. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But the thing that I'm really good at is mixing the music, the kind of music that I write. That's but right. That, that's also, that's also, that's also important too, because the kind of mixing that I do is, is, is having the live the sample libraries and the live player. It's a different kind of thing. You know what I mean? It's having the kind of sound design because like Mick uses a different kind of his, his sound design is all electronic sound design. My sound design will always have its origins in organic kinds of things, you know? So we have, it's different kinds of sound designs, the way that they relate to the, the music and the melodies and the orchestra and the sample libraries and these, those kinds of things. So it's, so I'm I'm very hesitant about talking about mixing on, on in a broad way because I'm not sure you could be good at mixing general. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah you kind of can. You could be, you could be okay at mixing generally, but it's, it's in the, because even like there's a, there's an incredible website uh, uh, called Mix with the Masters. Do you know Mix with the Masters? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've heard of it. Uh, yeah. Oh, dude, the, there's no better resource for learning how to mix. So I, I watch Mix with the Masters every single day and it's all about, I mean, but these are the guys who are like, I'm going to pull up a Justin Bieber tune that I just mixed. I'm going to pull up last Bruce Springsteen born in the USA. I mean, it's just like, these are the top mix engineers in the world opening up their sessions and talking about how they mix, you know? So I, wa I watch that every single day just to learn and, and apply it to the kind of music that I do. But one of the things that you learn from that is how specific they are to the genres that they do. Yeah, like, the yeah. like the guys who do hip hop do, because the thing is like with anything, you're, you're not going to have a love of the details. See, this, this is the thing, like certainly like, you know, with students I mix and, one of my students is a fantastic, you know, hip hop artist and she can't mix. I'm just doing her mixes for her. You know, and I'm doing a pretty good job at it, but I won't have the love of details of getting that 808 just right as the love of getting that French horn to be big enough. And what kind of EQ do you, you know what I mean? Because the things around the kind of music that I do, I love the little detail, like the little things like I learned from Alan Meyerson, like, how, you know, how to use mid side EQ on strings, like the teeny little details I love but I'm not interested in them at all in, in other genres of music. D does that make sense? Yeah, 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 totally. So when you're teaching your students, is this, is this a big part of your lectures, the mixing? Cause I feel like that's yeah. very, very vital. I know when I've done music, I've spent a hell of a lot of time just on the mixing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah Look, Cause I it's think, so important. Cause that's what I teach at, at, at the ANU. I teach, uh, Introduction to Music Technology, which is the fundamentals of mixing, and then I teach film scoring. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So mixing is incredibly, and, and I teach a broad skill of, of mixing about, you know, how to use stereo imaging and compressors and EQs, all those, all, all just the fundamental things that go across all genres. Hmm. Super, super important. I think mix, I think there's nothing important than is mi mixing is, because mixing is composition. Mixing is the composing. Mixing is the piece now. You know, so to, to separate mixing is a separate thing from composing. And this is also one of the, the big deals of with composers, because oftentimes composers think that the music is the dots on the page. Because as you, when, when you're brought up in a conservatory style, and we, we certainly have a big conservatory style, which is blended into other things, is to get across that those notes on the page aren't the music. The music is the recording, is what the music is. The notes on the page are just a means to get you to the recording, because most people, most, most composers think the music is the dots on the page. Well, it's interesting though, cause you can get five people and they can give you five different ways of how you should mix. Right. Yeah. It's, it's so broad. I mean, I know when I spoke to Mick, I asked his way of mixing and he said that he actually, the way he does mixing is actually in the composing stage and he bases it around the type of sounds that he's using. So with metal, for example, with um, one of his tracks, it, it was centered around the snare. So he made sure that all the instruments that he was using wouldn't um, clash in that frequency range. It was real, real fascinating how he does it. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, I mean, it's so, such a broad, broad art form. And as someone who's doing yeah, music totally. and you have to stay up with technology, right? And things constantly evolving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how do you manage to do that while teaching these yeah. students, while composing these scores? It involves a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. Look, I, I think I think the learning, I think the learning process is never ending. And I think you need to have a commitment to learning. Mm, mm. And this is one thing I think is as 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 one gets older, I think there's less people have less and less commitment to learning as they get older, but they have more of a vested interest in retaining, you know what I mean, and championing the things that they already know. So I mean, one of the things that I always do is I said, Every single lunchtime, I watch a half hour of Mix with the Masters. So this is all the most, the most up and coming recording engineers who are showing you the most recent releases of the most recent artists. I mean, I'll be honest, half the artists I don't even know. But like, I'm like, who's this person? I go on. Oh, they, they you know, oh, they have a billion. <laughs> oh, they, this, this this tune that I just saw on Mix. I go on Mix and Master. I don't know any of the songs, but I'll go look them up and I might have a Spotify playlist. So like once I understand and, and learn how, how it was mixed, then I'll go listen to the song and I'll be like, oh, it's got a billion hits. Whoever knew there was, <laughs> whoever knew about that. So I'm, I'm always learning techniques from, from those guys and applying that to my music. Um, 
I'm always, I'm always, I'm constantly buying plugins. Every week I buy new plugins and I'm trying and reading manuals and this new distortion or this new, you know, this, that, or the other thing, new stereo imaging software and trying it out and see how it works. And, and how does that, how does it work with the kind, you know, how does that plugin, how, how would that work with the kind of music that I'm writing? Like right now I'm really, really super into lo-fi, super, super, super into lo-fi just in terms of I have different kinds of I do everything in the computer I'm not interested in any kind of outboard analog gear because I grew up in the generation of outboard analog gear and it was just a pain in the butt constantly so I I, I don't I don't want to remember any of the any of those times like patch bays and analog yeah, computers yeah. and yeah I mean like back in those days the, the computers the, the, the synthesizers wouldn't even save if you made a patch it wouldn't save it you had to take a photograph of of the settings so then the next morning when you booted it up you'd have to so anyway I don't want any of that stuff I want everything right in the computer so a lot of lo-fi plugins like a tape emulation kinds of things you know so I'm really into I'm really actually interested in, in using that on on uh live sound sources and on you know strings and brass and getting different sounds that way Mm -hmm. final question before uh we wrap mm -hmm. up uh time flies right uh mm -hmm. how did you find it moving from america to australia because i think people think that just because they're english-speaking countries that they're very much the same but they're not are they they're not the same at all <laughs> it was so i'll <laughs> i it was very okay number one it was very very difficult probably the first two years were the most difficult two years in my entire life. For what reason? Uh, um, Australia is a social, it's not a capitalist kind of democratic thing like the, I, I think in Australia, I think Australians and Americans think that the cultures are much, I think Australians think that their culture is a lot like America and it's not it's very, very far removed, but they think the cultures are very, very close. This is very much a socialist society here, which I like. Okay, so the things I'm saying is, now I'm going to be an Australian citizen on the 22nd. I love Australia. Oh, wow, I love, congrats. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. I'm not, so I'm not saying this is a one is better than the other. They are so different, you can't imagine. It's just, in, the, in the US, it's capitalism, uh, survival of the fittest, be the tallest poppy you can possibly be. Uh, be the best you can be, be competitive. Competition is a great thing. Always strive to be the best. You know, don't do bad things morally, but try to be better than everybody, which is the exact opposite of Australia, which is you know, tall poppy syndrome. You know, the tall poppy gets cut down. Uh, be part of the, be part of the team, be part of the team, all decision-making. Like in the US, it's, it's top-down decision-making. Whoever's leading the thing just tells, just instructs orders and you follow. If you're on the bottom in Australia, it's very much a uh, collective ideas of things. You know what I mean? Like if you're going to make any changes, like for example, when I was head of the school, there were changes that I need to make. Now I was used to the American way, which is I'm the head of the school. This is what we're doing because I'm the head of the school. That's my job, you know? And then the staff, you know, would oftentimes got really upset because they're, you know, they said, well, you're making changes, but you're not consulting us in the changes. And then, and, and then I thought, why on earth would I be consulting you? I'm ahead of this. I, I was hired to do this, what, but not as a bad thing. Not, not that I don't think their ideas are important, but why? So, so to the American brain is why would I consult you? Why, why would I, you know what I mean? <laughs> your, your employees here, why would I consult you? You know, I was brought here specifically to do this thing. So a lot of that created, you know, I think uh, tension. <laughs> tension is a good way to put it but also good you know what i mean but we just but all of us sort of had to collectively learn that like they got used to the sort of the american style and i had to get used to being a little bit um more you know seeking seeking out other people's thoughts on on kinds of things yeah yeah well i mean but it's I, a double-edged sword right i mean there's pros and cons to both ways yeah, I, I completely agree. And also, one of the things that is constantly difficult for me that I've just stopped, like, I, I'm just, I'm a tall poppy kind of dude, man. I just, that's all I, I roll tall poppy. Do you know what I mean? I just, <laughs> I, I'm just, because even, because this is the thing that's so funny because of the tall poppy situation in Australia, because in the, in the US, I was a tall poppy. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it was like, and so I just grew up being the tall, you know what I mean? Just being a tall poppy. So, 
I can't suddenly not be, so I just, I just let it shine and have the haters hate, you know? And, uh, but the thing that's interesting about the tall poppy syndrome in Australia, it's not just the, it's not just whoever sticks their head out on the top gets chopped down. It's not a pushing down at the top, but it's also pulling up of the bottom. Like Australia is much, much more interested in the disenfranchised. So it's not just, it's not just pulling the top down, but it's pulling the bottom into the middle. And I like that a lot because in America, generally people could care less about the poor and the dis disenfranchised. I mean, it's a political thing, but I'm just telling you, people could care less about the poor and dis different disenfranchised at the bottom. So that's why people just soar high, don't look down. But I like the fact that that here everybody's looked at looked after. Like it a lot. And I and, and I love Australia. I have I have no interest in going, I have no intention of going back to the US. I have no interest in going back to the US. I think it is just terrific here. I think there's a great film industry here in Australia. And I think I've also I've got a lot more opportunities as a film composer here in Australia. You know, I mean I mean, look, even I mean the the, the 20, 20 the, the 2067 movie, that was the only Australian movie to ever hit number one on Netflix in this region. So this is this is what what what's happening I think we're we're seeing a real renaissance in in Australian film and I think it's I think I like to feel like I'm the right guy at the right place. So just as already like Seth and these uh, Seth has you know been trained by a lot of the Hollywood people just in terms of what he can bring in terms of production value to Australian film. I feel like I have the same because that's what I'm that sort of pedigree from the U.S. from John Williams from Alan Myerson. I'm sort of bringing that pedigree, that compositional pedigree here at the right time that filmmakers are making these kind of movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, hey, you're in the best place right now. Australia doesn't really have COVID. Uh, yeah. So it's pretty good, right? I mean, you can still go out and do your day-to-day -day things. So yeah, I mean, right place, right time. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Look, look, and I, and I look, I have a, I have a house in the bush. You know what I mean? This is what I've always wanted. Land. I got land. I, I, I don't have to ever leave my studio. I, I mean, other when I go to, I go to Canberra to go and teach, and then I come right back out to my studio here out in Braidwood, New South Wales, which is amazing i can't even when i look out my window all i see is mountains i can't even see any other houses it's awesome i love it love it love it love it. it's like the for, for me the best possible uh lifestyle which is great creative industry great environment great teaching environment a and u is awesome we have a great school great staff just a, and i got a beautiful place to live in the country which is what i've always always wanted my whole life is to live in the country I think if there's two countries that are very similar, it's it's New Zealand and Australia. So a lot of the stuff that you're saying, yeah, I can really relate to. I think uh, we value the the quality of life, the work life balance. I think is mm -hmm. one of the, the the important things. So yeah, well, yeah, hey, I, I can, yeah. So I complete I completely agree, and I love news uh, this whole area because also I chose to c come to this area. You yeah, know, you did. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I looked at their various. I had various opportunities around the. At, at the time, I was in a relationship, and and uh, we 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 wanted to leave the U.S. And so I was looking. So I I was looking at different places, and I did a lot of teaching in China. Was looking in Asia. I also did a lot of teaching in Europe, and I was sort of looking at Europe, and then so Australia, Australia, New Zealand area is a place that 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 we chose to come, because it it it. We like the culture and had the things that we were interested in here. Mm. Cool. Well, hey, that's a perfect place to wrap up. Um, so if anyone wants to follow you, where's the best way of them following you and getting all the updates and seeing all the music that you're working on, <laughs> so to speak? You could go to uh, my website, which is kenlample.com. You could, uh, and there you can contact me if anyone wants to contact me. I love hearing from people. Uh, I have a YouTube page, but the very best thing is to follow on Spotify. To be a Spotify follow is 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 the thing because all the latest stuff is going to get released there, and that's also the most important place to release music. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, Ken, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. I know you're a busy man, so I appreciate you taking the time out. Uh, so that's the show, everyone. Make I sure appreciate. You Sorry, what were you going to say? <laughs> Now, yeah, I was going to say thanks for having me, but you should wrap up with your blurb that I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Uh, so that's the that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. Support Kenneth and all the ventures that he is doing. And uh, stay safe until next time. See you later.